Cassandra Gunkel, a folklorist by training. And I'm coming to you today from Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia in particular. My line producer is Bonnie Tobin of the Pennsylvania Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I've worked with Bonnie over the last couple of years to design uh, online series on food, culture, history uh, in Southeastern Pennsylvania. So this is our second year and I wanna give you a taste of what that series is about uh, by taking us into China and how China uh, made its way, Chinese food, Chinese uh, uh, eating traditions made their way to Philadelphia. And I'm calling this, this little segment, A Taste of China in Philadelphia. Uh, previously on this series, uh, we've looked at Native American food and gardening traditions, Quaker uh, traditions that came here to Philadelphia and spread throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, so in A Taste of China, uh, we're gonna look at what did come from China directly uh, to Pennsylvania. The earliest mention of a specifically Chinese item, soy and tofu, really comes from Benjamin Franklin writing in 1765 to Philadelphia's favorite gardening son, John Bartram. Benjamin Franklin actually mailed some soy seeds to Bartram and uh, in the letter accompanying the, the, the seeds, he talked about this kind of cheese uh, that was made from using these seeds, boiling them down uh, to create the product we, we now appreciate as tofu. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So Benjamin Franklin and John Bartram in the 18th century uh, are beginning to dabble with this specific taste that comes from China. Also during the 18th century, we have another favorite son, Stephen Gerard, uh, using his uh, resources of a sailing fleet to import Chinese goods into, uh, into Pennsylvania. Uh, Gerard was operating a sailing fleet, a merchant sailing fleet uh, after the embargo of Great Britain against America, preventing uh, all kinds of uh, foreign goods from coming to the shores. So America needed to come up with its own trade routes and Gerard sent ships directly to China. Interestingly enough, the first things that came to China, that, that came to Pennsylvania from China were uh, accoutrements, decorative decorative objects, decorative items, and I'll show you some of those uh, in a little bit. The Chinese really begin to flow into this country in the 19th century. Actually, Chinese men are coming for work opportunities. Chinese men are coming in uh, to the West Coast uh, in the 1840s. They are working on the gold rush. Uh, by 1885, the majority of the workers uh, building the Transcontinental Railroad were Chinese workers. However, they're beginning to face uh, a, a huge backlash by American workers. Uh, and so by 1882, we have our first uh, immigrant, anti-immigrant act, the Chinese Exclusion Act that, that limits uh, and it limits and, and in fact closes the door on Chinese men coming in. However, by that time, they're in this country, and again, it's pri primarily a male Chinese population, they're in this country, they then begin to move east. And it's around this period of time that China towns are established in various big cities, including Philadelphia. So Philadelphia's Chinatown comes into existence in the 1870s as men who'd worked on the gold rush, worked on the railroad, make their way East. And so it's a predominantly a male community, male oriented community. Um, it's very enclosed and restricted, really, because of the racism that existed around that community. Uh, another big uh, influence on the foods and food traditions that come from China uh, is President Nixon and what we called at the time, ping pong diplomacy. Uh, the Chinese and Americans were 
a, they were in fact playing ping pong, but uh, through the work of Henry Kissinger uh, and trade talks and negotiations, we have another open door period uh, when Chinese ideas about cooking food come wholeheartedly into the United States. Uh, that open door policy on Chinese trade under Nixon sort of meshes with the vegetarian back to nature movement that was happening in this country. Uh, and so uh, with more goods coming in and ideas here ready to embrace it, we have uh, wok and stir fry cooking uh, and uh, myriad ways with tofu uh, coming to the forefront. In fact, soy, soybeans in Asia have been a crop for more than 2000 years. So, you know, we had Chinese, the Chinese and uh, around Asia in general, they were doing much more with tofu than we could ever have imagined. Um, it wasn't until 1935, right around World War II, that the American Department of Agriculture sent uh, an agent to China who wrote this really lengthy report on uh, all of the agricultural practices that were happening in China. Uh, and out of this large report, 36 pages were just about soybeans and what the Chinese were doing with soybeans. Um, and today still China uh, produces 40% of the soybean crop for the world, for the world. Other places are doing it now. And since that ag agent went to China uh, in the 1930s to come up with this 1949 report, uh, American farmers began to use soybeans as a food crop for animals, for animals. Uh, and, but it's uh, the soybean product that China has really been uh, magnifying in its uh, agricultural production and, it, and with its food production. Uh, and one observation at that time was uh, if more of the world ate like the Chinese with this soy-based diet, uh, we could exist uh, very healthily as vegetarians because of the high protein nature of soybeans. Uh, so now I'm just gonna show you some of the products that I think are pretty familiar uh, to us now. Um, you can go into any grocery store these days and find soy milk. Uh, I don't know if a, I, I'm making an assumption here, but I assume most, most of us know what soy sauce is and what to do with it. Uh, miso is a soy-based product. It's used to create a soup, create a stock, create flavoring. Um, tofu comes in all shape sizes, uh, firmness, firmnesses, um, and it's today considered a, a, an essential component in uh, vegetarian cooking as a way to um, get protein into our diets. But just going through my kitchen cabinets, uh, I, I don't think I'm unusual because the last time I went to the grocery store, there was a whole aisle of quote unquote ethnic um, goods to buy. The majority of those were Asian ethnic goods like shrimp paste or oyster sauce, or let's see, um, ponzu seasoning. And I'm, I, I'm just pointing all of these out because they are in fact all based on soy, soybeans, soybeans. So today it's, it's, uh, it's an easy thing to find these products. They're not foreign. Uh, since the 1970s, they have become really an essential, an essential part of uh, ethnic cooking, Asian cooking, as, as it were. Um, in the 1970s, we saw stir fry cooking and this, this item, the wok, making its way into American kitchens. Uh, so that was uh, the open door policy of the 1970s that brought that kind of cooking into American homes. But it was the Stephen Gerrard's uh, trade of the 18th century that brought, um, I guess what we now call chinoiserie, uh, Chinese teapots, uh, teacups. Uh, I, I have this blue and white design to show uh, the willow pattern. Um, so at the time that we were opening the door with China, China was 
producing things that they thought the Westerners would like, like teacups without handles. So this is a very early Chinese product to try and suit the taste of Westerners. Uh, and this is more in line with teacups in, in China, uh, the shape uh, without, without handles, so forth and so on. So if you join me in our series, uh, I talk a little bit about the history of what these cultures have brought uh, to our kitchens and to our gardens. Uh, and then uh, in the evening show on Wednesdays, we actually use recipes and cook, uh, use these items to cook, prepare some food dishes or uh, even a whole menu uh, using some of, these, uh, some of these goods. So I hope you join me uh, and thank you. So I wanna share some of the ways you can see the influence of Chinese food and eating culture in your local grocery store. Um, these days you can go into any grocery store uh, and find soy milk as one of the many alternative dairy uh, milk products that, that's available. And of course, tofu, uh, since I guess the healthy eating vegetarian movement of the 1960s and 70s, you can find this in all cons consistencies. Uh, tofu, another soy-based product uh, available, at least in Pennsylvania, going back to the time of Benjamin Franklin. Um, and then there are items that you might not think are soy-based. Um, miso, uh, fish sauce. Really, if you look at the condiment aisle in that Asian section of your grocery store, you're gonna find some of the myriad ways that the Chinese have used and incorporated soy uh, into everyday eating. And of course, going back to the 18th century when Stephen Girard initiated uh, trade with China because of the British embargo, we saw goods coming from China into the Philadelphia port. For example, uh, teacups. China was making teapots and teacups um, for the Western audience. So, you know, Western motif, but teacups without handles, completely without handles because they're more in the style of what you would find in China, in China. Um, so really, since the doors have opened, we've had China coming in and we've been able to consume it in any number of ways. And of course, if you will join me later uh, at the six o'clock showing or presentation, I will be cooking, cooking uh, food items, preparing dishes, using some of these products that you can find that won't, won't be the same as eating in Chinatown, but it'll be an accessible way for you to enjoy a taste of Chinese culture in your home kitchen. Yeah.